and know what needs to be done uh, to help and, and, and to make the grace of God a uh, 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 powerful, practical working in their lives. Shepherds build community. And so if you have a pastor, just a singular pastor, upon whom you have hung all of the responsibilities of leadership in the church, but he tends to be <coughs> leaning and biased towards the apostolic and prophetic pattern, there is great risk that the community building of the shepherd will be lost, which is why it's so critical that in these days we work to identify those of you who have specific shepherding reflexes and to not just simply let you be at it, but actually pull you into places of leadership and influence so that shepherding, community building is a part of what we are actively doing within the church. And then we will uh, go to, so some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be shepherds, some to be teachers. And we will talk about that uh, in two weeks' time. Campbell is speaking next week, but in two weeks' time we'll talk about teachers. And the teacher is uh, that person with a, a, a specific or unique wisdom to make the abstract and difficult questions of life make sense. And every church family needs to have those teacher personalities within them. So, today we're going to have a look at the evangelistic um, picture. Can I just, uh, before I even preach, go on a bit of a rant? I'm getting as far away from the pulpit as I can right now. So that you know that this is me. This is not a part of God's Word. Uh, because probably I'm going to say something that might potentially offend some of you. I am really, really, really frustrated these days with definitions that are being attached to the word evangelical. Know this, the word evangelical does not appear once in the Bible. It is not a biblical word. It is a title that the conservative portion of the Christian Church has assumed upon itself because of our passion to see the lost saved, to be evangelistic. But in these days, that title is beginning to take on some things that I don't like. I'll just say it that way. And so I have stopped referring to myself as an evangelical. And we're part of the evangelical tradition. I'm not going to deny where we have come from and what we've been attached to. It, but that evangelical tradition speaks of the desire within our hearts to see people come to the Lord. One of the core values of the Church of the Nazarene, do you remember what they are? There's three of them. We are a Christian, which is to say we're going to stand on Christian orthodoxy no matter what. And it says we are holiness, which is to say that we believe that God doesn't simply want to get us to heaven, but by His Spirit He wants to work within us to make us after His image, to be a holy people. And the third core value is that we are missional, which is to say that everything that we will organize ourselves to do is going to be intent on being out there somehow to bring people to Jesus. So I am not abandoning in any way the core theology of what we've always been. But when other things get attached to it, I think it's maybe time to chuck the word. It's just a time. Just call me a lover of Jesus, would you? Just call me a lover of Jesus and you'll get it right. And I don't care whether you want to label me by some category that slots me in this part of the Christian movement or wherever. I don't, you know, whatever. I just love Jesus. And we just need to love Jesus. That said, Paul makes it utterly clear in that passage that he, Jesus himself has given to the church those who have an evangelistic spirit or gifting. He calls them the evangelists. Now we, as we move forward, are going to be careful to not just simply arbitrarily use the proper noun. Oh, you're an apostle, or you're a prophet, or you're a teacher, or you're a shepherd, or you're an evangelist. Because we're really looking for the leadership within the church, and so we're just saying that we need to be apostolic, we need to be prophetic, we need to have an evangelistic spirit to us and be shepherding and have that teaching character to us. And so I'm not talking about evangelicals, not even specifically talking about evangelists, because that also brings to your mind all kinds of images of Billy Graham and others who go out to big stadiums and preach. But more the evangelistic reflex within the church. So, rant and introduction done, let me bring it to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 8.
we are about to meet a person named Philip. And um, there are actually two Philips in the New Testament. If you were to go back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry and he called some to be what we would call apostles, well, we remember Peter, John, James, and, and, and those prominent ones, but you'll see in the list also a Philip. And then, if you come into the book of Acts, and uh, a couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 6, you'll see that there's a group of, uh, of, of, uh, of seven ministers appointed by those apostles to do some very specific ministry. Here's what they're doing. What's going on is that as the church now is in its infancy, and beginning to sort of stake a claim within the community, the dominant Jewish community wants nothing to do with them. And not only do they try to marginalize them uh, in terms of their religious and their faith systems, but they actually start to discriminate against them. Where those who uh, would be without nothing and who would go to the Jewish temple to, to receive some kind of support or, or food or things like that, they were being cut off if they were identified as being part of the Christian community. And specifically within the Christian community, there were some who were converting from outside of Judaism, but from Gentile background, from Greeks. And they would absolutely not be getting any kind of support within the system. And so the church began to respond quickly that, hey, we've got to organize ourselves to make sure that those marginalized, those oppressed, get taken care of. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you were at our, our Seeds of Life gathering yesterday, the focus of the church upon the oppressed. And so they organized and they, and they picked seven people. And in chapter uh, 6, it, it says that they choose these persons. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas of Antioch, who was also a convert. And these seven persons are given the specific task of moving within the, this, this emerging Christian community to make sure that nobody gets lost between the cracks in terms of being cared for and have a, 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 livable, uh, a livable income if I could bring uh, contemporary language into it. All right, so, so Jesus calls a Philip to be an apostle. Here the church appoints a Philip to be one of the servants within the early church. And here in chapter 8 then, we're going to meet one of the Philips. And there are plenty of hints here that tell us who they are. Um, boy, I'm doing a lot of introductory comments. Stephen, the one who's identified as being filled with wisdom and grace, uh, faith and grace, is uh, stoned to death. So angry is the Jewish community over this emerging Christian witness that uh, he gets stoned in public, rocks beating on him until at last one final blow would have knocked him unconscious and the rest of the rocks taken the life from him. And it's the uh, character named Saul who would later become, after his conversion, the Apostle Paul who led that attack on Stephen. And in chapter 8 it says this, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Note this, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. You caught that, okay? So the apostles were not scattered. The apostles would have included Philip the apostle. Here though we have reference to Philip going down to Samaria to preach must be the one who had been appointed as a minister within the church community uh, when it was first beginning to formulate itself. So we call this character not Philip the apostle but Philip the evangelist. So let me continue to read. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. 
They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem, the apostles, right, they didn't get scattered, in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. It simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now you can keep going and read the story of, of this Simon character and how, uh, how he gets a little distracted by the powers and wonders that he's seeing, but that's not the story for today. Today we're talking about the characters of the evangelist or the evangelistic uh, leadership bias. And I promise you that that includes some of you here. Now I know that if I were to have you take a test and it were to score you high as evangelists, some of you would freak out. Because indeed, your reflexes look to either persons who are on the television or on the circuit traveling who can proclaim the gospel with such fluidity and such ease and the people stream down the aisles to stream Jesus and you're saying to yourself, that is not emphatically me. Or you would look around the sanctuary and you say, oh, I know that person. They, they seem to be able to lead people to the Lord really, really easily and that's not me. It might, in fact, be you. Let's talk about the characteristics of the evangelistic spirit. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, my brother, who does not serve the Lord anymore, went off to Canadian Nazarene College, and he went for one year, so the year afterwards he brought home his books, uh, and I sort of dug through some of them, and one of them was this green padded big book called Evangelistic Ex Evangelism Explosion. 1975 or so and as I would later learn it was like in every preacher's library everywhere you go James Kenley's evangelism explosion and it basically worked like this you were supposed to somehow earn an opportunity to get into someone's living room you would sit down and it coached you very well you're supposed to compliment the people in the pictures on the wall or the nice setting of the of the lamp over here or whatever build that rapport and then at the opportune moment you were to say to them may I ask you a question if you were to die tonight do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? There's, the, there's like there's the candle and like open, right? Spiritual conversation. And usually the person is supposed to, this is how your coach is supposed to say, well, I've lived a pretty good life. I'm no worse than the next person or whatever. I mean, I believe there's a God or whatever, which for uh, James Kennedy was like, like, eh, wrong answer, because you need to get in there and say, listen, you're not saved by your life, by your works, by the way you lived your life, but in fact by the sacrifice of Jesus. And hopefully then, if you had memorized the program sufficiently, you could, you could sort of direct the whole conversation so that by the end of it all, you have the person sitting across from you saying, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And you'd go home and you'd report back to the, to the group and say, hey, you got one. And hopefully you got a whole bunch. And, and wave you at Bingo. Around that time, the uh, Bill Bright Four Spiritual Laws, Campus Crusade for Christ, came along. Who later amended to become five spiritual laws because they realized that they needed to talk about sanctification a little bit, though they didn't use that word. When I was a teenager, when I was growing up, when many of you were growing up, evangelism was invariably attached to some powerful preacher or to some system for presenting the gospel in a way that people can sort of understand it with their brains and become a Christian. Usually, it would go something like this. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross as a sacrifice for your sins, and Jesus was resurrected back to life so that if you confess your sins and believe in Him, through faith, you will be saved from judgment and gain eternal life, which is so incredibly theologically accurate, but it's so out there. Right? It's a textbook. It's, it's talking about salvation as some kind of a external model of belief system. I believe that, by the way. You can put me underneath it. And all of you who have given your life to Jesus will say amen when I say something like, but it's not a belief, it's a relationship with the Lord. Right? Right on cue, thank you. <laughs> However, 
For those of you who have a particular bias within your soul as an evangelistic, you might memorize some of these tools, because they might come in handy for you. You might pull out the pamphlet of the Four Spiritual Laws. You might talk objectively about what Jesus has done for us, but more than anything else, when you sit down with somebody and discover that they don't really yet walk with Jesus, your reflex is to tell them all about your friend, Jesus. And you will talk to them about what He is doing in your life. You will talk to them about where He brought you from and the, and the grace that, is, that, that has delivered you to this good place that you're in right now. And you will talk to them about the opportunity for them, what, to become a Christian? No! You want to use that language. You will talk to them about the opportunity for them to know the very same Jesus that you know. See, that's the evangelistic reflex. Because it is born not out of a sense of what we need to do. I know what I need to do. Do you remember that Paul says to Timothy when he's giving him instructions, a young pastor, who by the way is going to go pastor this church in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus. And one of the things he says to him when he's saying, remember the gifts that were late when we prayed over you, remember do this. And by the way, do the work of an evangelist, he says to Timothy. you got to do it. So I do it. <laughs> Oftentimes, though, I revert to James Kennedy's evangelism explosion model when I talk about Jesus if he's over here. The evangelistic calling oozes out of your pores because you are in love with Jesus. Is that you? Might be. Might be. I'm not an evangelist. Well, listen, do you ooze Jesus? You just might be an evangelist. Um, the evangelistic spirit is desperate for a response. Because you know that this Jesus has changed your life because you made that conscious decision to walk with Him and allow Him to be the Lord of your life. You know that this person who's just heard your testimony of how good Jesus is, is not going to get it. They're never going to know it. It could be an objective kind of, oh, that's interesting, I'm prepared to believe that. But they're not going to really understand the joy that is in your heart unless they too make that step and say, okay, I want to be in a relationship with you, Jesus. And all of us have to say amen to that because it's true, right? Some of you don't sleep very well at night because your friend, your neighbor, the person you just had an opportunity to talk to didn't make or has not made that decision yet. And it keeps you awake and you're restless and you're frustrated and, and, and you cry out for the Lord somehow, Lord, but you just give them an opportunity to hear again, to meet you again, that they might know you as I know you and others of us. I have no trouble going to sleep. Sounds awful, actually. But sleep's important. What I'm saying to you is that you may be an evangelist or have that evangelistic heart if you cannot get out of your mind the need of your friends, your family, your neighbors to know Jesus that you know. What else do we know about the evangelistic spirit? Well, the evangelistic personality is within a church community can be quite infectious, which is not really a good sounding thing actually when you think about it. I don't want to be infectious, except that they're the culture shapers for a church community. One of the reasons it's so desperately necessary that we as a church community make room to listen to the evangelists in our midst is that they will be ever reminding us that at the core of everything that we do, we are an evangelistic church. We are missional. And when we stop being missional, 
We abandon the core of what we have been called to do, the commission that says go and make disciples. And the evangelistic mindset or personality is never going to let us forget that they've been praying for their neighbor and I had an opportunity to talk to my neighbor and my workmate was struggling and I had an opportunity to pray with my workmate and they're just going to be constantly talking about their interactions with people who don't yet walk with Jesus. And we absolutely must listen to them. Why? To learn. Yeah, but so that they set within the culture of the church community the normalcy that we talk about the need for people to come into a relationship with Jesus. Listen, you do not have to walk far or drive far to spend some time in a church community where there is little conversation about people being lost. That cultural reflex, pardon for that words, can be lost to a church community. And it is the evangelists who are going to provide that leadership role for us that are going to keep that as a focus um, for us. One more thing, and then I'm going to go into the story here of, of Philip. Um, you might be an evangelist if you see individuals before you see crowds. If the whole party shifts to this side of the room and you spot the one person and your reflex is to go and to hang out with them and to find out what's going on in their life. Notice in my whole conversation, if you might be an evangelist, nowhere did I say, because you love public speaking. Because what we're looking for is evangelistic leadership. Not specifically evangelists, but evangelistic leadership so that the whole church will carry on that personality. Here's what we know about this character named Philip. Now, he's obviously identified early as a man of, of, of great spiritual death because the church ordains him, as it were, along with Stephen and the others, to be ministers and leaders within the church. So we know, we know already that he's been judged to be a character of outstanding quality and spiritual depth. And so much so that then as the story moves away from Jerusalem, as the church begins to spread around the world, we get this little excursion where we actually follow Philip into the countryside of Samaria and one of the cities there, and we get to hear the story uh, of what's going on there. The Bible tells us that Part of Simon or Philip's effectiveness was because he was demonstrating great power. Apparently, miracles were taking place in response to his ministry. We live in a very sophisticated day. There's a lot of skepticism and cynicism about the potential for miracles to take place, uh, and in truth, there probably are some miracles recorded in the Bible that had they had the sophistication of scientific inquiry and study that we have today, that we would say, oh, you know what, what happened there was that it was that very explainable, that it was, wasn't a miracle at all. But understand, of course, that God, the great Almighty One, the Eternal One, um, while He does not chart our tomorrow's as if they are scripted and can't be changed. He nevertheless is the one who is authority over all of tomorrow and is the one who will guide all things toward his glory and his goodness and his greatness. And so that God can still manipulate and move even the natural processes of life. And if it is God who's doing that work, that is no less in my mind of a miracle than anything that comes out of absolute no explanation. Is it possible that the evangelistic ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ in 2018 is meant to be accompanied by such radical transformations in persons' lives?
that really we just kind of want to fall back and say, oh my goodness, that's a miracle what happened in that person's life. I mean, they were this, and now they are this. That doesn't happen because you begin to believe the things about Jesus. That happens because you begin to live in a relationship with Jesus. And we see here in Philip that where he is going with his ministry, running for his life into the city of Samaria, that there is miraculous things unfolding, things changing, things being transformed, so much so that the local magician starts watching it because he's blown away by what's happening, because he was pulling like hats and rabbits out of his hat, but these are real lives that are being changed. And he, in fact, gives his life over to Jesus. We learn that it's a little bit uh, self-serving. He just wants the power. But oh, how powerful is that? So, all of these things that we've talked about that we could we can begin to continue to dig around and see as characteristic of Philip, and therefore are characteristics of those who have that evangelistic spirit. There's one part of the evangelistic spirit that is real deficit, or has a real deficit in their ministry. And it's something, if, if you find yourself leaning and saying, you know, that's kind of me. I, I desperately hunger for my friends to come to the Lord. Or, I, I, you know, I, I, I have a relationship. I want to tell people about who Jesus is in my life, not about the belief system. I can't even do that. Like, if you're feeling it this way, here's something you need to be on guard for. and something that we see happens in Philip's life. Philip moves on. He goes on to the next place. And the Bible tells us that the people that he had led to Jesus had not had opportunity to be filled with God's Spirit. One of the great risks that you must guard, O oh, evangelistic leaders, is to think only about this person's relationship with Jesus in the immediate sense. And to be not so concerned about them growing into depth in their belief and in their following. Your reflex will be to spot the next person who has not yet met Jesus and go to talk to them and upon recognizing that they've entered into faith with Jesus, you'll spot this person over here and you'll talk to them. And you will leave it for someone else to do the discipling of that person. Church. That's why we have to make these things work together. If you had a pastor who is only and all about evangelistic enterprise, we probably would see something that looks like this, a great big door with all kinds of new people coming in all the time and getting saved, and a great big door over here where they walk right back out the other side because nobody has helped them to know about what Jesus has called them to be. Like the song we sang earlier, not just giving him my sin, but everything within. So that's why we need all of these emphases within the church to work together so that the church is built up to the glory of God. So Simon, uh, so, so Peter and, um, and John travel down from Jerusalem and they go and, and they come to these new believers who are all so stoked about coming into relation with Jesus and seeing all kinds of miraculous things going on and they say to him, hey, God wants an actual living relationship with you where it's not just Him out there, but He wants to be in you. He would come into you by His Spirit. Do you want that? And they all become filled with the Spirit. And this story begins to be uh, spread out with more depth of, 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 of Christian discipline and, and discipleship. And Philip moves on. We really need to be working together on this. Um, got a few notes here before we're going to turn our attention to the, the, the Lord's Supper. At the core, at the core of those of you who are, are going to play the role of the evangelistic leadership voice within our church, at the core of it, you are in love with Jesus. Don't just want to be able to know about Jesus. You want them to know in their hearts this same Jesus. 
We need to identify evangelists and make them leaders within our church community. Why? Because reconciliation with God is the main point. It's why we exist as a church. We can't let the evangelists go alone. They need us. They need us. They're going to want to go to the next audience or the next person. We need to come in right after them and to scoop up these people who have entered into this novice early relationship with Jesus. And we need to take responsibility for helping them. Those of you who are teachers, you will play a vital role in helping them to understand how their new faith meshes with all the things that are going to be chucked at them in life. Those of you who are shepherds, it is your role to draw them into the life of the church in community. Those of you who are prophetic, yours is going to be one to perhaps is going to be speaking into their lives and helping them to become alive and aware of where this is headed in their life and why they may need to make a change. And the apostolic voice in the church is going to help that person to make their newfound relationship with Jesus, their faith, a vital and relevant ministry on behalf of Jesus into the community and world around. We see it, it all works together. Are you one of the evangelists in our church? I, I ask that question and I know that some of you even go, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, because I can't speak. There's nothing to do with it. Some of you might end up speaking in great stadiums someday, okay, okay. But these characteristics of the lover of Jesus who wants to tell people about the relationship that you have with this Jesus and an anxiousness that even makes you restless at sleep time to see these persons come to the Lord. Is that you? Maybe it is. Let's pray together. Father, I am so grateful for these who are part of your church and grateful Lord God that into each of these people you have you have gifted and you have indeed wired them even from their mother's womb you have you have made these persons who you intend for them to be and so I pray Lord together with these who are in the room with me that you would help us Lord to surrender our lives to you and surrender to you to do that which you have called us to do Lord, I pray on behalf of the church, help us, God, to make room amongst the leadership for those who are wired towards evangelism. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song in response, and then uh, we'll have communion together. Would you stand as we sing? Thank you. 